Welcome everyone. Today I'll be discussing mount powers, insignias, and mount collars for PvP. First up, I'm going to go over why it's important to have a high mount bolster in PvP. Now, if you look at the bottom right corner here, you can see my mount bolster. In my case, it's 100%. You can also see the 6k item level it grants me. If I hover over the tooltips for my two mount powers, you can see that they also have 3k item level each. Your mount bolster increases these item level sources as well. This is not why your mount bolster is important though. The real reason you want a high mount bolster is because it increases the values on your mount powers directly. If you look at Ariel Ornament here, you can see it gives me a shield for 30% of my maximum hit points. Now, if my mount bolster was lower than 100%, this number here would not be 30% anymore. It would be something lower than this. Maybe it would be 25%, 10%, etc. It depends on how low my mount bolster is. If your mount bolster is too low, your mount combat powers will be really watered down and weak, which is a significant disadvantage in PvP. Now, you don't need the full 100% mount bolster, but I do recommend you get it pretty high. I'd say, se I'd say you wanted it at least 75%. Ideally, you'd go all the way and get the full 100%. Another thing worth mentioning is you want to make sure that, you, that the mount your combat power came from is mythic quality. As an example, if you got your golden lion at legendary quality and you didn't upgrade the lion, but you did have 10 mythic mounts for a bolster of 100%, your combat power still wouldn't be maxed out, because the mount it belongs to isn't maxed out. So you want to make sure your choice of combat power is among the mounts that you upgraded to max. Now to give you guys an idea of what it costs to get a high mount bolster, I'm going to show you mount prices right now. As you can see, oh, okay, as you can see here, there are a ton of good account-wide legendary mounts available on the auction house for really cheap prices. You could easily get 10 of them for under 10 million, I mean under 5 million. So for under 5 million right now, you can have 10 legendary mounts pretty easily. However, if I remember right, having 10 legendary mounts only brings your mount bolster up to 50%. So to hit that 75% I recommended, you need a mix of mythic and legendary mounts. <sighs> now mythic mounts, you can see, as you can see here, are more expensive. Keep in mind you can also upgrade your existing mounts to mythic quality. This won't necessarily be cheaper than buying the ones on the auction house though, so be sure to compare prices. Uh, moving on to the next topic. As you can see here, I changed the text on the screen. The four mounts listed there are the four strongest mount powers in, in PvP. These mount powers are overpowered, and too many people running these at once can kill the PvP queue by causing, to, by causing people to quit. They make conditions more hostile to undergeared players, and they also lower the quality of the fights enough to discourage experienced players from continuing to play. That said, there are situations where inexperienced players on weaker classes do end up meeting these mounts. It's common for barbarians to start out with damage problems, and paladins always have damage problems. But sometimes we, al we also get players who don't have time to fix their builds and need a quick way to make themselves more useful. So it's actually fun for them to play. Now on PC, the PvP community does allow people to run one banned supplement item in solo queue only. So you could either run one of these broken mounts or you could run a hardcore boss, mini boss ring. You aren't allowed to run both at the same time. The reason being is there's never a good reason why anyone would need to run two banned damage supplements at once. One maybe, but two threatens the queue pop rate for no reason. 
Vandevere is OP in general. Ring of Darkness is OP when used against Ranger in particular. Rejuvenating Favor, when combined with a hardcore boss mini boss ring, is if anything even more OP than combining one of these rings with a 3k damage mount like TV. For private matches, the community hosts on PC, all four of these mount powers are completely banned. Now with all that said, I will go over each of these four mount powers one by one, in case you are one of the players that needs them in solo queue. Rejuvenating Favor is the strongest self-healing power in PvP. Rejuvenating Favor is something I've tested very recently. It heals me for 130k ticks. Note that this is 130k ticks, not 130k total. So this mount power literally heals me for over a million HP over the course of 10 seconds. The only drawback, the only drawback to this power is it doesn't help you defend your teammates directly like Swift Golden Lion does. With Swift Golden Lion, you want to, if you want to knock an enemy over so they don't kill your teammate, you can do that. You can't do that with Rejuvenating Favor on. However, Rejuvenating Favor can still passively help you defend teammates if you body block for them or use it to fight aggressively without fear and put your enemy on the defensive. Now, moving on to Toad. Toad has a whopping 3k magnitude damage. That is a huge hit. This mount power is also undodgeable for all classes except two. Barbarian and Warlock are the only two classes that are able to dodge Toad. Nobody else can. Now Toad does have a significantly slower cast time than Tunnel Vision does. Moving on to Tunnel Vision. Tunnel Vision has a really fast cast time by comparison to Toad, and it has the same damage as Toad. Tunnel Vision can be dodged, though. Like, unlike Toad, you can dodge Tunnel Vision. In the hands of a skilled player, Tunnel Vision is actually better than Toad is, because the faster cast time is more valuable for winning games than having an undodgeable power is. If you're hitting all of your attacks anyways, then why would you need an undodgeable power? Now, if you are an experienced player, you'll know that you don't literally see enemy tunnel visions coming exactly. But you can still sense when an enemy is about to use tunnel vision. This power is too fast to actually see coming. But you can anticipate it pretty easily or just get lucky on dodge timing. Now, the fourth power on this list is more rare. Golden Touch comes from the Golden Warhorse mount. Like Tunnel Vision and Toad, it is also 3k magnitude damage. Its casting in animation is like a blend between Toad and Tunnel Vision. It feels hands off to aim and cast like Toad does. Its animation is also long like Toad's is. But like Tunnel Vision, Golden Touch can be dodged. Golden Touch is really good when you are on a node, but it's bad when you are traveling in between nodes. This is because node battles tend to distract the enemy. There is often a lot going on, so you will probably succeed at hitting them with Golden Touch while they are, while they are distracted. And it might even be unpredictable enough because they don't see this power much that you might have higher odds of hitting them with this power than something more traditional like Toad or, tel or TV. When traveling in between nodes and trying to hit people on your way there, it's relatively quiet and your enemy will probably see Golden Touch coming and dodge it. As, some, as something to mention about 3k magnitude mounts in general, they give you the power to instantly correct both, you, both your teammates' mistakes and your own mistakes when it comes to clearing enemies. If your team messes up on killing someone, you can instant nuke that enemy with the click of a button and save the node. If you lose a fight with your regular powers, you can instant nuke someone to replace it uh, to replace part of the rotation you just botched. 
3k mounts also make it possible to win one versus ones versus tanky players you'd ordinarily have to rotate around or get your teammates to help you kill this power comes at a cost though most players abs do most ab most players absolutely do play worse when they are used to their teammates insta writing their clearing mistakes all the time players who ordinarily wouldn't use a 3k magnitude mount also frequently start using theirs to try to counter you if they see you using your 3k mount first so if you are an experienced player you may notice that using a 3k mount reinforces the behavior from your teammates and your enemies that led to you thinking you needed the 3k mount in, the or in order to compete in the first place we saw this a lot during seasons uh, moving on to the next topic If you look at the text on the screen, it just changed again. Those are the strongest fair play mount powers for PvP. These powers are safe to run in any PvP content, and these are the powers we recommend people use. None of these powers are banned anywhere. The two very best fair play powers are Aureal Ornament from Swift Golden Line and Bat Swarm. Lion is the best mount uh, for defending your teammates. It's also good for keeping yourself alive. Bat Swarm is the... Bat Swarm is the best and smoothest percentage damage increase from any mount. Even if your initial target flees, you will still have a a 15% damage boost active against everything else. It also has a CC break. Notably, the CC break sometimes continues to work after it is supposed to have ended, but this appears to be inconsistent and only applied to some control effects. If you don't, if you don't own the uh, those two mounts, there are a lot of there are lots of close runner-up options you could use instead. Eclipsed Ornament is from the Eclipse Lion. This mount prones people just like the Swift Golden Lion does, but instead of a shield, it hits the enemy for 600 magnitude damage and gives you a damage boost. This mount is good, but it does a poor job defending you compared to Swift Golden Lion. You'll probably be very fragile with this on. Now there is another lion around now. Neverwinter Ornament is from this mount here. This is one is from the Echoes of Prophecy campaign. This combat power is like a slightly worse version of Swift Golden Lion. It's probably good on Rogue since it grants combat advantage. Now notably for this, in order to have good defensive value from this, you need to have good self-healing too because it increases your maximum HP by 6%. It doesn't give you a shield. So you need something to fill up your HP gauge beyond your maximum, so you need self-healing. This, uh, this combat power is probably really good on Rogue, since it grants combat advantage. It might also be good on Fighter. Fighter has pretty good odds of being able to fill up that HP, that their HP gauge by that additional 6%, and they also tend to benefit from combat advantage. Just maybe not quite as much as Rogue does. <sighs> Rimfire or Frozen Retribution is from the new Frost Salamander mounts. It is very similar to the Bat Swarm combat power, but it is it does have one important difference. It decreases your enemy's deflection chance. You don't want to decrease your def enemy's deflection and chance in PvP, because when they deflect and you have high accuracy, you will do extra damage to that enemy. It's still pretty close to Swarm in terms of performance, and it has a really good casting animation too. Arcane Maelstrom here is from the Arcane Whirlwind mount. 
This power takes a bit more skill to hit with than something like Tunnel Vision or Toad does. It doesn't do quite as much damage as a 3k magnitude mount, but it still hits pr it still hits plenty hard, plus it prones people. It can hit more than once, and it can hit multiple enemies too. Divine Intervention is the power from Celestial and Divine Wings. This power is not as powerful as it was in Mod 19, but it is still a good power. It has a massive hit range, it does okayish damage, and it also has some defensive applications. This mount's knockback can be used to cancel other people's mount combat powers mid-cast. If you activate wings when somebody is trying to hit you with toad or tunnel vision, those, their mount powers will go on cooldown without activating. This knockback effect can also serve as a life-saving interrupt. This map power can hit through walls, and it can also hit people in the spawn area on PvP maps. You could also, in theory, use it to knock people off of nodes, but it's going to be a bit harder than it would be for a wizard with repel to do that. As a history lesson for the wings mount, back in mod 19, this mount could hit enemies for 500k each when rogues cast it from stealth. This mount had an unexpected drawback, though. If you kill too many people within the same 20 seconds of each other, they will all respawn at the same time. This often resulted in hordes of very cranky full HP enemies stampeding the middle node and massacring all your teammates. This mount needed to be timed smart, but when used right it was best in slot for rogues back then. Now, the reason I give you that history lesson is in case this mount ever becomes more powerful again. Like, let's say the meta shifts to be even to be much more damage focused than it is right now, and this mount goes back to being overpowered. You might want to know that information about it having a drawback. Something else you might want to know about it is when you hit, like, wings actually kind of has to be positioned or aimed a little bit. Even though it's got a massive hit range, it's not a it's not a radius. There is a limit to what it can hit. It, as far as I can tell, it will hit everything on your screen as long as it is on your screen. If you set something off screen, it will probably not hit it. So you want to kind of be moving forwards when you cast it, and you kind of want to be pointed vaguely in the direction of what you're trying to hit. Now, nowadays, the wings mount would only be able to kill enemies while they are at low HP, hence why it's become more of a defensive mount than an offensive one. Now, moving on, Magnificent Inspiration, this power here, or Grand Inspiration in my case, are the combat powers from the Pegasus mounts. Notably, the magnitude for these powers isn't really 3k. It says 3k in the tooltip, but its real magnitude is 1.5k. The cast time for this mount is slow, and it's easy to see it coming. But when it hits, it can do some serious damage. This mount is something of, is something of a skill hit. I've seen rooks use it well. It's also good any time a lot of enemies are not paying attention, which happens pretty often right now. The legendary and mythic Tyrannosaur mounts... Uh, these here give you the Tyrannosaurus Rexum combat power. This mount combat power is good against dodging classes, especially ones that don't have an elven battle enchantment on. This CC effect for it can be used in a very similar way to the stun from Halster's Blast Scepter to hold people still for an important encounter hit. Most people who get hit by, by the Tyrannosaur react to it as like they were hit with a stun effect and will just freeze in place. However, T-Rex is not a stun effect, it's actually a root. So if you were standing close enough to that enemy when you cast it, they can turn around and hit you still, if they wanted to. They can't walk, but they can still attack. And another thing to mention about this mount is it's great against dodging classes that don't use the elven enchantment. So if it's a dodging class and they don't have an elven on, this will be a really strong mount against them. 
but this mount is not very good against shielding classes. It's quite bad against fighter and paladin, and it c probably is okay against barbarian, but probably not great, depending on what kind of barbarian it is. If it's a squishy barbarian, in theory, it should be still be really good. But for shielding classes, don't use T-Rex. Uh, against the shielding classes, I mean. I mean, if you're on a shielding class, you could use it. But I mean, if you're a, a trying to use it against a sh another shielding class, that's not good. It is good to use against dodging classes. Just don't use it against shielding classes. Now, as an important disclaimer, four or five people running the same mount power can still be OP even for some of the fair play options. A good example is Swift Golden Lion. This isn't something you are likely to see rules about outside of a tournament setting, though. Uh, next up, we have the strongest mount passive powers for PvP. Rapid Accuracy, which I've got on my screen here. Oh, hang on. There's supposed to be a text change here. Okay, passive powers. You should be able to see that on the screen now. Rapid accuracy grants 4.5k accuracy. It is a popular choice for classes and builds that need high stats. Tensor's floating disc grants this power, and so do several of the epic 2k accuracy mounts when you upgrade them to mythic. Now... The next one up is Providence. Providence is the passive power from Swift Golden Lion. It's really good, it heals both you and your teammates fairly often. This power is best on classes that, hit a, that get hit a lot and don't need maxed out stats. So if you're getting hit a lot and you don't need the maxed out stats, such as a fighter or a wizard. This power is good on things like Rogue and Ranger 2, but it isn't best in slot for those classes, because those are the classes that tend to need more stats. For runner-ups, we have Rejuvenation. This is the passive power from Skeleton Steed. So Rangers and Fighters used to run this power, but it fell out of favor after it got nerfed. That cooldown was pretty punishing for people who were running this power originally. Stalwart, uh, which I think is, yeah, it's here, is a decent mount passive power as well. It grants HP. The easiest way to get it is to buy a War Triceratops and upgrade that to Mythic. But you can also get this power from upgrading epic mounts that only grant HP to Mythic. This power doesn't get used much anymore. Doesn't get used much anymore because HP is easier to get now, and 18k is not that much. It used to be 50k when it was first released, but it was changed to 18k, and then HP became much easier to get in Mod 20. Now, Runic Aura, which here it is, is a good team support mount power. All of the Mana Core mounts grant this combat power at Mythic. It is outclassed by Providence, but if you didn't have Providence, this is a good option for Bard and Healer. Okay, moving on to Insignia Powers for PvP. If you look on the screen, I changed the text again. Now, the big three Insignia Powers for PvP are Survivor's Blessing, Barbarian's Revelry, and Oppressor's Reprive. You only need one copy of each of those, but you could also double up on copies of Survivor's Blessing and Barbarian's Revelry if you wanted to. Uh, this is especially good if you're not completely maxed out or anywhere close to it. If you are, oh, if you're on a undergeared build, you're probably going to want extra healing instead of the Assassin's Covenant and the Gladiator's Guile that I have here. So you might want to consider adding a second copy of Survivor's Blessing and a second copy of Barbarian's Revelry. You could also, uh, you could also add. Oh, let me find it here. 
You could also add a copy of Champion's Return. Champion's Return is also a good healing power. I'd say Barbarian's Revelry is proven to be a little bit better than it, but it's also good. Champion's Return is a solid power if you want to add some extra heals. Now back to these big three here. Uh, the classes, as I've, as I've explained in other videos about the CC uh, stack system that's in PvP, where if you reach four stacks in a PvP setting from getting hit with control effects, then you will go completely immune to CCs for 10 seconds. So you'll be completely immune to crowd control for 10 seconds if you built up four stacks from being hit by different control effects by your enemies. Now this influences your insignia choices on classes. Classes that get hit more often and spend more time out in the open tend to favor extra copies of Survivor's Blessing and Barbarian's Revelry rather than trying to add extra copies of Oppressor's Reprive. So if you're a wizard, fighter, ranger, anything like that, you will not go CC immune. I mean, you will go CC immune way more often on those classes. So those classes, get, they go CC immune more because they're getting hit more and they're building up those control effect stacks more. But if you're a rogue, you get hit basically the, lo the least amount of times out of everybody because you've got stealth and you're often hiding and behind stuff so that you don't go splat. So for Oppressor's Reprive, this power, as I mentioned, it stops working when you are CC immune. So if you're not going CC immune very often from that CC stack system I mentioned, which is definitely the case for Rogue, then you benefit a little bit more than the other classes do from Oppressor's Reprive. So if you wanted to, you could add an additional copy of Oppressor's Reprive on a Rogue. This would probably be better fit for undergeared Rogues, not necessarily all Rogues. And if you're a wizard, fighter, ranger, anything that's exposed a lot, you want more copies of Survivor's Blessing and Barbarian's Revelry. You might even want to consider taking off uh, Oppressor's Reprive altogether to make room for more stacks, and maybe you want to put in Champion's Return somewhere too. Now, there's some other options for players that don't need the extra heals from the other two slots. Uh, Gladiator's Guile, you can see here. Assassin's Covenant here, too. These are both good. And, like, as I mentioned, I, like, I already mentioned Champion's Return. Now, there's probably a few other decent insignia powers I'm forgetting about that are for just pure damage for PvP. Maybe a Ranger that's maxed out would have a reason to run those. But I don't know that much about it. So there could be some more good insignia powers out there if you don't want to run all heals. But for most players, I'd say you want at least the big three. And optionally, you could add some more stacks of Survivor's Blessing or Barbarian's Revelry. Or maybe add a, ch a copy of Champion's Return in there too. Uh, moving on. The best insignia types for PvP, like going over the actual insignias. Now, the best insignias for PvP, for most players, are going to be insignias of brutality, like these things here. They grant power and critical severity. For most players, that's best in slot. Now, the other best in slot option is fortitude insignias which is HP and defense. Now, pretty much everybody is gonna be running a mix of the two or all of one type. For me, I've picked 10 insignias of fortitude and five insignias of brutality. Now, if you're a ranger, you probably want more insignias of brutality and fewer insignias of fortitude. And like, it really depends on 
what you're trying to build for and whether or not you actually need more power and critical severity or not. Like in my case, I'm basically capped on both power and critical severity in combat in PvP. So I had this all this extra space that I could go allocate into defense and HP. So I did it. Now, there are two other insignia choices that I looked at and considered, never actually ended up doing, but these are s solid options as well. Insignias of Aggression. These are Critical Strike and Critical Severity. This would be a solid choice as well. I didn't personally end up doing it, but you could. There are also mastery insignias. If you're having accuracy problems, then this would be a good choice as well. And control bonus is good against players that are not running an elven battle enchantment. Uh, especially if you're running things like Blast Scepter or T-Rex. So if you want, if you're running Blast Scepter and T-Rex or other controls, then you might want to consider these a set of mastery insignias. You'll probably have too much accuracy, to be honest, because there's going to be other places you could pull it from. And you might be lacking in a stat that you would normally have a double of, like because you've got control bonus, you're not getting a primary stat. But this is still a good choice. Like, it's a decent insignia. Now, moving on. The best mount collars for most PvP DPS players. Now, I would say that would be Wayfaring Barbed, which is Critical Severity. Like, Wayfaring Barbed, Critical Severity. Sturdy Crescent, which is Encounter Power Damage. And Unified Crescent, which is Movement Speed Increase. This is the best three collars for most players. Now, in some cases, uh, maybe you'd want to consider the Daily Collar or the Atwell Collar, but I'd say for basically everybody right now in PvP, they're going to get more damage out of their Encounter Powers than their Atwells. I mean, in PvP, like, you're not getting, like, you're not quite as Atwell dependent even on something like Rogue as you would be in PvE. Like, in PvE content, Rogue's... Like, rogues have a very heavy dependence on at-will damage. Like, they run the at-will collar in boss fights for PvE. But for PvP, rogues are more or less encounter dependent. We do have gloaming cut, but that's nothing compared to what rangers get in PvP. Rangers, I'm pretty sure, have like a 60k at-will hit or something like that. I'd have to ask Razor Leaf again. And the daily collar might be good on Rogue, but I'd say you're still better off with the encounter because you get more encounters than dailies. Now, the movement speed collar, that's kind of a no-brainer. You want more movement speed on just about everything except maybe Bard. Bard might not want to run this collar, but everybody else would. Now, there are some other choices, which you can see on the text block, block on the screen. A uh, bard might want to consider a recharge speed increase collar instead of the critical severity one because they have critical severity 40 and they might have an easy time capping that. So if they're if you're a bard and your critical severity caps out super easily, then you could consider the recharge speed increase collar instead. Uh, there is also. The Stamina Gain Collar, which would go here if I was going to bother running it. The reason I didn't is because I didn't want too many empty item level sources for this build. And you just don't get a lot of stats for what you're getting, like for the, eight, for the item level that you're adding. So it was going to risk throwing off my stats a little bit. So I just chose not to run it at all. Now, Stamina Gain, if you were going to run this fourth collar, is what I would pick here. Uh, you could run a Control Bonus Collar. A again, if you're 
using something like Blast Scepter T-Rex and you're going against somebody who's a dodging class that does not use an Elven Battle Enchantment, maybe you want that Control Bonus Collar. If you're a healer, maybe you want the Outgoing Healing Collar. Like, I'm pretty sure it does not interfere with anything else you'd want more, so that's probably what you would put there on a healer. Now, you could also put in a Practical Barbed Collar for Glory Gain. Now, you don't need that Glory Gain Collar for anything uh, effective that relates to your effectiveness in PvP. But if you're just trying to make a little bit more glory so you can have more healing potions, then that might be a good collar to consider. If you look at collars right now, they are insanely cheap. I just noticed this today. Like, absolutely insane cheap. These used to be one million each not that long ago. And you can see they're worth dirt at the moment. You can have basically any epic collar you want for really cheap. Okay, now moving on. <sighs> for selecting mount combat powers, remember to take your class paragon personal needs uh, like for selecting the mount combat powers remember to take your class your paragon your personal build needs the current meta and allies needs into account also remember that some mount powers are only good situationally or versus certain kinds of enemies uh, here are some real examples bat swarm suits whisper knife really really well but Assassin Rogue does better with Lion and T-Rex than it does Bat Swarm. Bat Swarm is better than Lion is on Ranger. Wizard usually needs a defensive power, such as Lion. Now, in the case of Wizard, if they're running something overpowered, like Tunnel Vision, then in that case they wouldn't need a Lion. But uh, under most circumstances for private matches, you want your Wizard on a Lion. Like, in general, if you're running a fair play mount power for any PvP content, the best thing you for a wizard is always going to be Lion. Now, for Swift Golden Lion also allows you to defend your teammates directly, which is really nice. And T-Rex is good against dodging classes, as I've mentioned dozens of times at this point. But it is a poor choice versus shielding classes as I mentioned earlier. Okay guys, I'm fairly certain that was everything. See you guys next time.